Exclusively on Secular Media Network, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto. Hello and welcome to the Gaytheist Manifesto, your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. I'm your host, Callie Wright, and today we are discussing the folks who end up on our journeys with us. This doesn't even necessarily have to be confined to being queer or transgender. There are many situations in life we end up in where the journey is taken on not just by us, but by those who love us. So today, I'm going to be interviewing a few people who are important in my life and asking them about their journey and coming to terms with losing the burly, bearded, fat, metal dude I used to be and gaining the person I am now. First up, I have an interview with two of my best friends, Jamie and Eric. Jamie is the founder of A Voice for the Innocent, which listeners may remember from the Pride wrap-up segment we did in the What's Next episode. Eric is on the board as well. Jamie is a guy I met in high school because he worked with an ex-girlfriend of mine. Years later, we ended up in a band together, driving around the country in a van with no air conditioning, with six or seven sweaty dudes. Boy, that was awesome. I've known Eric since we were in seventh grade, and he is my oldest friend. We bonded initially over a mutual love of Limp Biscuit, and it was all downhill from there. Eric and Jamie were also among the first of the very small handful of people I came out to at the very beginning of this whole thing. So they, along with my second guest, Marie, have been on this journey with me the longest. So I'd like to welcome Jamie and Eric to the show. Eric and Jamie, welcome to the Gaytheus Manifesto. Thank you. So, um, Eric and Jamie are, you know, two guys that I've known for, for, uh, a, a lot of years. And, uh, Eric, how long has it been for us? Oh God. Um, it's probably been 14 or 15 years at this point. It's hard for me to say seventh grade, whatever that was. <laughs> and Jamie, is it when, like five or six years for us? Has it been longer than that? Um, I always counted as longer cause I met you when we were in high school. Right. <laughs> right. Cause you worked with my ex-girlfriend. Yes. So even though we weren't like technically really good friends or anything, I, I met you then and had a, a general awareness of you. And then, <clears throat> yeah, it's probably been probably been five or six years since we actually started hanging out. All right. So, <laughs> so, so, Jamie, I'll start with you. Um, basically, in anyone who has listened to the show before has heard me talk about Eric and Jamie, just not by name. Um, so. Jamie, of of my close friends, you were the first one that I actually came out to, and and I remember sending you a text saying, "Hey, um, you're gonna be home after work tonight. I got something I need to talk to you about." Um, so when I when I finally stopped dancing around what I had to say and actually came out and said it, tell me kind of what your thought process was. Yeah, you sent me that text at work, and you told me because I know I remember I offered to to leave work early. And uh, you said, oh, no, it's not a big deal. We'll just meet up later. And uh, I thought, like, all right, so you've got to tell me something, and you're not telling me what it is until we're face-to-face. So it's serious enough for that, but not not a big deal. So, like, I I had probably probably a million different scenarios come through my head uh, where, you know, uh, I thought that, you know, maybe maybe you were gay. Um, I thought that that maybe, you know, you've always been a a pretty strong atheist voice and I've, um, always been on the more spiritual side, especially then. So I thought like, maybe you wanted to talk spirituality. Um, you know, at the time we were starting a voice for the innocent. So I thought maybe you had, uh, you know, started to remember a lot of times those memories get repressed. So I thought maybe you had started to remember something that had happened to you earlier in life. Or I maybe thought that like, I didn't think this was characteristic of you, but I thought like you had maybe done something that, you know, um, you wanted to come clean about to somebody, you know, like I, I didn't think that about you, but I was just trying, trying to find possibilities, you know? Um, 
literally, you know, coming out as transgender was never the thought that I had. And so um, I was expecting one of those four and maybe a couple other responses. And um, when we finally sat down and when you when you said, I, I think I need to spend the rest of my life as a female, I, I just felt, um, gosh, I didn't know. I, I, I really felt blank. I, I just wasn't prepared for it. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't mad or upset. I just had no prepared responses for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had spent so much time thinking of how I was going to respond to any of the other ideas that maybe came into my head. And, and that was not one of them. Um, and honestly, for a while, I mean, I think probably starting that day for a while, I expected that this was a phase, you know, um, I had never met anyone that was transgender before. Uh, it was honestly fairly, it was a fairly new idea to me. I mean, I, I knew that it existed, but I knew really nothing about it. And for a, a guy who, um, tries to stay pretty informed about social issues, this was just one that was, you know, not one that I knew much about. Um, so I thought that it was, I thought that it was maybe something you were thinking right then. Uh, but I, I honestly never, I didn't think it would go much further than that conversation or maybe, maybe another conversation or two, you know? So that's, that's kind of where my thought process was. I didn't, I, th I guess I didn't see the enormity of it. Right, right. And Eric, what about you? The The situation was a little different because I roped you into dinner and a movie. And <laughs> and if I remember, it was uh, Star Trek Into Darkness. We went and saw Star Trek. And and I was like, hey, like let's go grab some food. I got something I kind of want to talk to you about. And, um, and, and, and I think this was probably only a couple of days after I had had this conversation with Jamie. So it was not, you know, the how sure I was of all this didn't, you know, didn't really change between, you know, those times, but I was a little bit more, I was a little bit more confident in my delivery because when I was talking to Jamie, I danced around it for probably 10 or 15 minutes before I came out with it. So, um, it, it, and I remember I spent just a couple of minutes doing that and I literally just said, I think I'm transgender. And so tell me when, you know, when I said that, Eric, what, what was going through your head? Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of time to, uh, you know, think out uh, what my potential responses would be. And when you said that, I remember sitting there in the booth at IHOP, and, and I knew you had something to tell me, but we had kind of skipped over um, that for some time while we ate. And then I remember you, you just kind of laid it out on the table, and I was just like... That is not what I was expecting you to say <laughs> to me at all. Um, I, you know, like Jamie, uh, don't didn't know much about, you know, what transgender was, what the issues were, um, but you know, I, I had an idea, and um, wow, it was a surprise. I, I didn't expect that, and um, yeah, I, I think I was kind of just floored, um, but. You know, I just remember thinking, like, this is, like, my best friend. <clears throat> I don't know what this means, um, but if it makes you happy, then I'm I'm with you. I'm behind it, you know. Um, but, yeah, it was it was definitely a surprise. You know, I, I had remembered you as, you know, someone very different, and I didn't expect <laughs> that. <laughs> so, right, yeah. the, the burly, like, metal band bearded guy. Like, right. Yeah. Jamie, at one point, not too long after that, you'd sent me a Facebook message saying, Hey, um, you know, I love you and I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do this, but you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this and I don't know what to do with that. Um, so if you could kind of talk a little bit about that and kind of, kind of where you were, um, when, when you sent that. Yeah. Um, I, it was a struggle for me. And, and, and so part of me felt like, you know, selfish because it wasn't about me but you know there's also that aspect of you can't really control how you feel about certain situations sometimes you know um and i i knew that i knew that not being friends with you wasn't an option so that left me with just being supportive and learning as much as i can and and uh you know trying to support you in 
in um, as many ways as I could, just like you have done for me, you know, I mean, it wasn't ever an issue of, I can't be friends with you, but I, I struggled so much with, you know, what's it going to be like to hang out with you and, and while you're presenting as female for the first time and I've known you as that big burly, you know, metal guy. Like, and I felt, I felt selfish because, um, you know, again, it wasn't about me. Like I, I was worried that we were going to be subject of stares and criticism from strangers when like, you know, who like that again, it wasn't about me, but, but I was in that the situation. So I felt really selfish for that, but I also felt really like I've, I've never supported someone through this and I really don't know how. And as I said before, like I kind of thought it was going to be a phase as stupid and cliche as that sounds. I mean, like, you know, you see, you see like, you know, 50 and 60 year old same sex couples at every single pride parade that have some sort of sign pointing out how ridiculous of a statement that is, you know, it says like been together 30 years I guess it's just a phase. You know what I mean? Like you see those signs. Um, so I know how ridiculous it was to have thought like, oh, this is something that, that you were going through right now, but it's not going to be something that, that sticks. Um, but I didn't know that then. I guess that's just what I thought. So, um, I mean, I thought about that. I thought about, I mean, I, I remember feeling like I was losing my friend who liked metal and Star Trek and Doctor Who. Um, that I, that I talked about all those kinds of stuff and other nerdy stuff with or other musical stuff or that came over and watched movies. Like I felt like I was giving that friend up for someone of, uh, you know, the opposite gender who said they were going to be the same, but I wasn't really convinced and I'd never really met that person. You know, like it was a really difficult thing for me to say like, okay, let me give up one of my best friends for someone I've, I've never met. Like that's, that's how my mind worked somehow. Um, I remember that was a big struggle and it was, and still is kind of a struggle for me about, you know, replacing memories, you know, it's, I mean, I guess it's not replacing them, but when I think about when we toured in a band together, you know, it's one very specific person and the person I'm talking to right now is, is someone completely different. And it's, so it's, I guess it's a bit of a challenge, not like emotionally, but sometimes it's a little bit difficult to reconcile that that's, that person is one and the same. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so I hear that. that. I remember, I remember just, just really not knowing how, how to support you and, and really selfishly being worried about how it was going to impact me. Like, I didn't think I was being, I wasn't trying to make it all about me, but I still felt selfish about a lot of it. And what about you, Eric? Did you have, I mean, I know we talked, you know, we talked a lot, but, um, you know, Jamie's, I think Jamie's always the friend that's the one who's like, look, you're being stupid or like, look, you know, I have this thing that I need to say. Like he's always like very, very forward. And Eric, you're like, you're usually a little bit more tactful. So like we had some of the same kinds of conversations. Um, I mean, I remember specifically once you were asking about like, you know, how are hormones going to change me and what's that going to mean? And like, I remember at the time I didn't have an answer. So can you kind of talk me through your feelings at that time? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's funny, Jamie and I even kind of confided each in each other, um, during this time, just because, you know, we were all pretty close and, and we didn't really know what was going on. I, I definitely feel like I was... I was worried um, because I mean you're you're literally my oldest friend, and and I didn't know and just like you didn't know you know I wasn't sure um, you know if your personality was going to be affected uh, just because I just didn't understand how you know how hormones and stuff like that would work um, and then I also remember kind of going through like. I guess I'm basically just echoing Jamie's statements, but um, I, I felt like I would kind of went through a period of mourning too, like, you know, um, and it was kind of brought home with a conversation that we had where I think you were struggling with how you wanted to present yourself um, since you had come out um, to, to basically the world. And I think you had said, you know, well, what does this mean? Like, do I, do I, seek out all the old pictures of me and and take them down you know because i don't want people to see me as who i was and i think at that moment i was just kind of like wow like this is really things are really different this is my oldest friend and i don't i'm scared that i'm gonna have to hide 
what we had. You know what I mean? That relationship. And um, it was definitely, like I said, it kind of turned into a period of mourning for me. Obviously, that, that wore out as I, as I began to realize, like, well, you're not really changing the most important ways, um, at least to me, um, except that, you know, you're now happier with, with who you actually are. Um, so yeah, I was definitely concerned. Um, but really I think it was just a lot of, a lot of conversations, a lot of long conversations we had that kind of assuaged some of those fears. Well, and so, I mean, talk to me about now. I mean, is it still, is it still awkward? Is it still weird? Are there any sort of, you know, residual feelings like that? Does it kind of go back and forth where, you know, sometimes it's not a big deal and sometimes it's, you know, those come back. Like, how does that work? I'll start with you, Jamie. Now, I mean, <clears throat> no, I, I don't, it's certainly not, um, not anything like it was. I mean, you know, we, we learn situations, you know, we learn how to, um, how to act in them and, and what's appropriate and what's not. And I think, you know, uh, several things happened. Um, one was just that, I mean, I had that, that mentality early on that I was refusing to, to stop hanging out with you or stop being friends with you. Um, so I had, I had to just like, that was the only option. I, you can't just be a friend from afar. Like I didn't want to be like a really shitty friend Sorry if you don't cuss on your podcast. <laughs> You're uh, good. It's PG-13. I, I Shit, shit's okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to be some really shitty friend who, like, always, you know, like, blew off plans with you or something like that. Like, but said, like, oh, no, I still support. Like, I knew that if I was going to still be a friend, it had to be genuine. So that meant, like, that meant putting to rest, like, my own insecurities or figuring out how best to support you learning actually what it means to be transgender. And even though that's not an experience I share, like that doesn't mean I can't be educated on it. And that doesn't mean that I can't like be friends with someone like that, you know, that, that is in that world. So like, there's, there was absolutely no reason for me to stop being friends with you. Um, so it was, it was literally just a matter of, of learning how of learning. And really like, I didn't have to learn much, you know, like at the end of the day, you were still my friend and it didn't matter how you were presenting or what name you preferred to be called. Like you were still my friend, you know? So, um, I think once I saw that it all came much easier, you know, all my, a lot of my fears were laid to rest. I mean, like now we've obviously had, um, very, very subtle disagreements with points of view. Um, <laughs> I mean, as I stated earlier, like I'm, I'm not an atheist, you know what I mean? So we have, uh, differing opinions that, but I, I mean even still i think we're pretty much in the same corner as far as how people without faith are are treated you know what i mean and and, and everything so um the only thing i still struggle with now which is like it's not even an emotional struggle it's if i'm telling a story from before you came out i i trip up on you know pronouns or i trip up on the name maybe but it like I'm only telling the story to people who typically know you. So like, it, it's not even something I have right. To You're not like outing me or anything, obviously. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, people that knew you before you came out knew your name and knew how you looked then. So it didn't matter, you know? Um, so it's not some, some big thing. And uh, I think the other thing that happened was um, I was fortunate enough to get to know Micah, who, who uh, obviously those that, don't know is a, is a transgender person that I worked with. And, um, when I first met him, did not know that he was transgender and, um, really kind of found out, uh, around the time that you came out. So I was able to learn both from you and from Micah, you know, and, and learn different points of view and, and learn, um, just all about what it, what it is to be transgender. And, and, uh, you know, I, I like Mike a whole lot. So it was really cool to, um, I guess it was just really cool to see that. I mean, it made it, made it a whole lot easier for me to, to have somebody else to talk to, you know, it wasn't, it, it just, it was able to open my eyes up to a world that, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize existed, you know? Yeah. Well, and I remember a conversation we have, and I think it might've even been at new year's last year, uh, where you were saying like you had just kind of just now sort of realized that like, this is, this is actually a permanent thing that this isn't because, you know, in fairness, in fairness to that point of view, like, 
I tend to be kind of an impulsive person and I tend to like, you know, do things and dive into them for a while and then move on. So like, I totally never blamed you for feeling that way. <laughs> um, but I mean, talk to me about that. I mean, was it kind of like an all at once thing? Like, Oh wow. Like this, or was it just kind of a gradual realization? I mean, I think it's gradual, you know, there was, and honestly, I don't, I don't remember. Um, I don't remember specifically saying that at new year's or any other time. Um, I know that I, I talked to Pinky um, about it, who's my wife, and, and I'd, I would talk to her about it, and I, you know, and I remember say like, there was a, a kind of a night that I was talking with her, and it was actually the night that I sent you that message that said that I was struggling, um, and I was talking to her about it, and she said, like, you know, it's good that you're finally admitting that you're struggling, because I think for a little bit, I was like, no, nah, I'll support you, I don't, I don't know how, but I'll do it, you know, and I didn't admit that there was any kind of um, any kind of things that I might be struggling with. And when I, when I was able to talk to her and she said, you know, it's good that you're admitting that, that you're struggling with some things. Uh, I think that's kind of when I realized, and be like, okay, you know, um, this is, this is something I need to embrace. You know, um, like I said, that, that wasn't as difficult nearly as I made it out to be, but I, I think that was actually the night when I realized, like, this isn't something you're just saying. This isn't just something you're, you know, impulsively doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, if at any time it, it kind of happened where I realized that it, there was some finality to it, it, it was then, you know. Um, and I, I like to joke, and I'll still joke with you, I don't think I'll ever let it go, that, you know, you coming out as transgender is, is a social experiment. You know, I'll, I'll tease you a little bit. <laughs> But like, I always, I don't actually. Do <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm writing a paper about it. It'll be yeah, published in like yeah, five yeah, years or something. Sir. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> like an AJ Jacobs book or any AJ Jacobs book, you know, um, where you just have to immerse yourself into a culture. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that was the night—the night that I sent you that message when I realized, like, or at least came to terms with, like, nope, this is this is the direction we're going in, and. You know, you can be a part of it and embrace it, or you can just leave and leaving wasn't an option. So, yeah. so what about you, Eric? Talking, uh, you know, today, like, do you, I mean, do you still have some of those same doubts or fears? Do they come and go? Like, what, what kind of where are you at today? I don't think uh, I really have much of a problem with it today. Um, there are some things that I deal with, like, and really this came to light um, basically the, the day you started. Well, at least the day that you first presented um, to me um, in, you know, a, a dress and stuff like that. Like you were dressing in the clothes that you actually wanted to be in. And I think we went out to the movies and, you know, I like to think that I'm not that person that like, oh, you know, cares about what other people are thinking. But um, it was definitely on my mind. And I think I had a big worry um, that, you know, like something would just go bad or like, you know, I think I was more concerned that that you would get a bad response. Um, and I wasn't sure how I would help you handle that, if that makes sense, um, I, you know, as a friend. Um, but, you know, I, I still deal with like, you know, I think for, for a while there when you had just started um, and, you know, honestly, you're probably passing a little bit less um compared to now and i think um you know we would like get looks or something at ihop and it would just like throw me into a fit of rage you know <laughs> like i'm like like yeah. thinking about like fighting like little 16 year old girls <laughs> or something <laughs> like that um just because i think i was still kind of insecure about what was happening and I didn't want you to be hurt by what was happening. Um, so, but you know, honestly now I, I think I'm to the point where it's like, you know, it's really not a big deal for me. I care much less about what people think and I'm really just interested, you know, in our personal friendship. So I think now I don't really deal with those kinds of issues and it's been some time, you know, you've taken hormones and stuff like that. For a while, I was concerned, kind of like Jamie, you know, um, well, what are the hormones going to do to you? But also, like, well, if this is a phase or whatever you want to call it, like, hormones are, like, at least from my understanding, are something that you, like, can't take back, right? Like After um, a certain period of time, yeah. 
<laughs> well, right, yeah. So, like, you know, I'm thinking, like, well, if Callie's, you know, taking these hormones, like, it must be... It better, it better well be. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, I think over time um, uh, that's eased up a little bit. And I think, you know, for sure, like, there are some things that I'm still learning, um, things that, you know, you're realizing over time that you don't like or you want to change. And, you know, I, I had problems with, like, I, I had problems with the pronouns for not v- very long, I feel like, because I kind of just said, like, oh, I'm accept- accepting it. But, um, you know, it's a learning process, and um, I think it's getting easier for me every day. And it, it was especially easier once I realized, like, I don't have to drop those memories. Like, those memories are still, you know, in my mind, and I can think back of them, and I still associate them with you, um, even though you know the situation was very different well yeah i remember that i remember that conversation actually because i think we we'd eaten at steak and shake or something like that and and we we were talking about you know like those pictures that we took when we lived in north carolina together and and you were asking like you know well what do you do with those do you like get rid of them and erase them and pretend like that stuff never happened and um and honestly like that that level of stuff had never really crossed my mind at that point because obviously you know there's like a million things going through my head at this point but I thought to myself, like, well, you know, the thing is, those are good memories, you know, like I have so many good memories from before, from, you know, living in North Carolina with you, all this stupid shit that we did as teenagers. <laughs> and then, you know, with you, Jamie, you know, playing in bands and I am the messenger and, you know, stuff with the voice of the innocent from before I came out and stuff like that. So like, I'm not, I'm not interested in erasing any of that, you know, um, you know, those are all, those are all super happy things. There was just this one unhappy thing happening off in the background. Like, um, so yeah. And and I remember that conversation and then I remember the, the look of relief on your face when I said that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean like you, you know, you've been so heavily involved in my life and you know, all the stuff that we did, like my wedding and the speech you gave and all that stuff. I didn't want to have to, you know, try to push that stuff to the side and it was it was very concerning for me but yeah big big relief when i realized that that i don't actually have to (laughs) don't actually have to disregard those those memories so wrapping up here if jamie i'll start with you since we've been kind of going back and forth um do you feel like going through this well and i guess this is probably a silly question but you know going through this experience with me like how have you one how have you noticed me change and two do you think it's changed you um i've noticed you change um and i i very much assuming that we're not talking about in obvious ways <laughs> <laughs> right the physical stuff i think is given <laughs> um i think that you are um more outspoken uh, on the issues that mean a lot to you um than you used to be. And I always knew you as like, like a politically conscious person and a socially conscious person. And, and you've, um, you know, embraced obviously LGBT rights and you've embraced, you know, what it means to be an atheist in the U S and, um, and where that, where those two intersect, obviously, um, because of this podcast. But I think that you are, um, I, I, you found your passion, I think, whereas, uh, I mean, and I, and I had to do that too. You know, I think that we grew up at a time where, you know, um, every, every guy that played guitar, their passion was music, you know, and, and music still very much has a very strong role in my life. And I know it does in yours too, but like music never drove me the way that, that my, my passion for, you know, with a voice for the innocent, uh, um, drive me. And, and I see that that, I mean, I, it looks like that's pretty much the same for you. You know, um, the, the injustices that you are working against now seem to drive you more than, than music ever did. Um, so I think that maybe uh, coming out has helped you um, find those passions and, and, and unveil, you know, that those mean something to you. Um, as far as your interests like I don't, obviously I'd still make fun of you for liking Star Trek and Doctor Who, 
Um, <laughs> so those, that hasn't changed, you know. Um, musically, like I just literally earlier today put a link to a Metallica wall, song on your Facebook wall. So like your music hasn't changed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. The things that I think I was worried about losing haven't changed at all. You've just found found your passions, I guess. Um, and that's that's nice to see in somebody, whether they're transgender or not. So, like, really, I mean, it was that that makes it a good experience for me. Like, if I've if I have changed at all, um, really, it's just I. I always ready to learn. I'm always ready to learn what uh, somebody else's life experience is. And, and this was just another example of that, you know, like um, even if I don't, I don't understand what it means to be, or I don't understand what it, what it is to be transgender because I'm not in the same way that I don't understand what it is to be African American or Muslim or, I mean, a million other subcategories of people. I don't understand those, but that doesn't, that I don't understand that experience. That doesn't mean I can't learn as much as I can about what, what it means to, to, for those people to be that. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think this is just a very strong example of like why uh, for in my life, why I have to always make sure to, to not reject people for things I don't understand, you know? Um, and I, and not, not, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought, but just always be open-minded. Like if you care about somebody and you, and they're in your life and you want them in your life, then that means, you know, learning how to support them and learning how to, um, how to be there for them and how to, um, how to continue to care about them really. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think if I've changed, it just, it's just reinforced my idea of being, being open-minded and being supportive, even if, you know, even if I'm not sharing an experience. And what about you, Eric? Yeah, I think I'd <clears throat> echo um, some of Jamie's thoughts that like, it's, it's something that's opened my mind um, up. I, I, you know, grew up in a, like a super Christian um, household and it's like you know i have these preconceived notions that even yeah, though you I've were my changed... christian friend that i would always debate with <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, how times have changed um <laughs> well but you know even even that has changed even though that's changed i still i feel like i deal with some of those some of those you know um remnants of those ideas uh that i grew up with as a child and I think, like, I just have to be individually approached with each issue um, to really fully understand. Uh, like Jamie said, it's not my experience, um, and and that's really opened my eyes up to um, a lot of the issues um, that that trans people have. And you know, um, I think <clears throat> I learned a lot too when you know you kind of started talking to me about like the issues that you were facing. Um, and I never knew that those were, you know, I realize now that those are probably issues that were always there. I guess I can't really speak for you, but like, you know, um, I think you're still the the same old caring friend. Um, you know, and I, I was concerned about like gender dysphoria and stuff and like whether that's a thing that you've always been dealing with or if that's a more recent, you know, development and, you know, obviously all the other issues like using the bathroom and, and stupid stuff like that, uh, that shouldn't be an issue at all. I think a lot of those things concerned me, but I think it's been relieving, um, that, you know, I feel like it's a, it's a process. It's a long drawn out process and it's painful, but, um, things have been working out, you know, for you, I feel like, and you're definitely becoming like, way more socially conscious on the issues you're still that same friend that i that i love to death um you know still facing some other issues um uh, you know regarding transition but um i think if we just keep the open dialogue we can kind of work through it together and whatever i can do to help i'm i'm happy to to do awesome well this has been a great discussion guys thank you so much for joining me on the show no problem thanks for having us more Gatheus Manifesto right after this. Today in school, I learned a lot. In chemistry, I learned that no one likes me. In English, I learned that I'm disgusting. And in physics, I learned that I'm a loser. Today in school, in math, I learned that I'm ugly and useless. 
And in gym, I learned that I'm pathetic and a joke. In history, I learned that I'm trapped. Today in school, I learned that I have no friends. In English, I learned that I make people sick. And at lunch, I learned that I sit on my own because I smell. In chemistry, I learned that no one likes In biology, I learned that I'm fat and stupid. And in math, I learned that I'm trash. The only thing I didn't learn in school today... The only thing I didn't learn today... The only thing I didn't learn... Is why no one ever helps. Kids witness bullying every day. They want to help, but they don't know how. Teach them how to stop bullying and be more than a bystander at stopbullying.gov. Before we jump back into the show, it's time to thank our patrons. Thank you so much for believing in us enough to contribute to us financially and for being a part of this movement. Patrons of the Gaytheist Manifesto have access to all sorts of cool stuff, like a big shout out on the show, premium content, including an audio journal I've decided to keep documenting the more personal stuff I don't dive into on the show, and an exclusive patrons only hang out once a month. If you're so inclined, head over to patreon.com slash the Gaytheist Manifesto to become a part of this movement and support the show. Thank you. Welcome back to the Gaytheist Manifesto. Next up, I have an interview with someone else who is very, very special to me. And someone who's been my rock, my role model, my inspiration, and my safe place throughout this whole journey. Marie, welcome to the Gaytheist Manifesto. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So, it might make sense for us to sort of put our relationship in context before <laughs> before we dive too deep into things because I think a lot of it will not necessarily make sense. So (laughs) you and I seem to have extended conversations a lot about exactly how to define our relationship. Yes, yes we do. (laughs) (laughs) And um, lovers doesn't quite fit. Best friends doesn't quite fit, but it is kind of all of those things as well. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) It's the most unique relationship I've ever been in in my entire life. So, um, I guess we can just kind of start there and just, uh, for the listeners, just know that that's, this is, uh, it, it's a very unique, very special kind of relationship. So you and I met and had this very special kind of relationship before I transitioned. That is correct. So When I first came to you and said, hey, this is some stuff that I'm struggling with and this is some stuff that I want to explore, talk to me about what went through your head. Oh, um, well, in in the context of that kind of relationship that we had, um, I always base those kinds of relationships, uh, in all of my relationships actually, on openness and honesty about um, the things that turn you on or uh, things that you want to explore. So you came to me and told me about um, having interest in feminization at the time and, and things like that. It wasn't something that I was necessarily into myself, but because of the kind of relationship that we had, uh, I definitely wanted to open that door and explore that with you because I felt I feel that everyone deserves um, to explore anything that they want to explore within the confines of a safe, loving relationship. So that in and of itself, you telling me that that's something that you wanted to do. Of course, I did not see that in a negative way, even though it wasn't something that I personally um, may have explored on my own um, between you and I. I uh, definitely wanted to give that a shot. So I started doing a little bit of research and, um, you know, how to, how to go about feminization and those kinds of fetishes and that. And that's when I decided we were going to go shopping and, um, you know, get you all the things I think that you needed at the time, the clothes and 
the makeup and the hair and all of that. And I just remember, um, I just proceeded to treat you exactly the way that I would at that time, had you legitimately been a woman at that time. And I remember walking away from that experience. I, I was actually pretty stunned that I never, that whole time that we were experimenting with that, I never felt like it was a fetish. I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. I re- remember thinking that I expected it to feel more like, uh, more like a fetish, more like some consensual humiliation thrown in there. I don't know if that's okay to explain it that way, but I, but I was shocked that I did not feel that way. It felt, I felt really natural. And that's and, how uh, I came away from that experience. In for context for the listeners, um, you've heard me talk about Marie several times before. Whenever I talk about my coming out story, um, you know, she is, she is the very special friend who, um, you know, helped me explore all of this kind of stuff at the very beginning. So, um, just so just to, to put that in context. And so when I came to you and said, Hey, like, I think I'm actually transgender. This isn't just a fetish or an interest or anything like that. Like, I, I think that this is, this is actually a thing. Like I might actually be transgender. Um, tell me, you know, tell me what your, what your thought process was at that, at that time. Well, I don't want to make it sound like uh, that there was much time in between those. <laughs> no, because events. there definitely was not. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, whatever amount of time it was, there was lots and lots of conversation, literally from the moment I left that day uh, until, you know, I, I mean, I remember talking to you all that night and the next day and just sitting by listening to you process everything that 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 had happened. And I think that I knew that it was coming. I think that I knew that by my reactions, like I was just explaining how natural it felt and how deep of a reaction you had, I'm pretty sure that I, I, I had an idea that that was coming. I remember being, being despite me telling you over and over again, that it wasn't (laughs) for a long time. And I, and I knew that it was, I, I knew it was deeper. I actually remember talking to you about um, the process of getting to that point was, okay, is this something that you just like occasionally? Is it something that you can kind of figuratively keep in a box and just pull out, um, you know, whenever you had that urge? Do you remember these conversations? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, or if it was something that you... Uh, you know, whether you were just a cross-dresser. I remember going through all of these different scenarios with you and with each one that we talked through and that you processed, I could just tell that we were getting a step closer each time to you actually coming to that realization. And I remember it's such a, a difficult mix of emotions for me. I was thrilled that you were so self-actualized that you could say, I am transgender and be so safe with me. Like that was a huge boost to me. But at the same time, I immediately was like, this entire relationship that we just built, um, you know, for however long that it was, because that was just a, that was just a piece of it. There was so much more. Um, This entire relationship just changed in a second to me. And I was scared. I was definitely afraid that I was going to lose, you know, not just that special relationship, but lose my best friend. And that was so hard for me. But at the same time, you were like this (laughs) tender little flower, like this little, this little seedling that was, um, and it was just like starving for the right kind of love and the right kind of affection and the right kind of support because um, you were brand new. So there was no way that the way that I loved you, that because of the way that I loved you, that I could leave you like that. 
despite my own feelings. <clears throat> so I just remember being very scared and overwhelmed a lot because you were experiencing some extremely deep, just mind blowing emotions of your own. You just totally and completely flipped your world upside down. And I just strive to be that rock for you that even though I'm going through a whole lot of stuff on my own, that any time that you came to me, I had to be, I wanted to be that one, you know, that could help you kind of navigate through some of that stuff. Um, the further along you got, you know, with each new announcement, such as changing your name and changing your gender marker and changing, you know, getting your social security cards and, um, you know, all of those things, going through the things at work that you went through. It was such a process. And with each step I think that you took, I started experiencing grief. Um, I was mourning over losing who you were. And that was, that was very hard for me. Um, the listeners don't know, but I'm very well acquainted with grief um, through different things in my life, losing people that are extremely important to me. And in so many ways, there was a parallel between what you were going through and what I had already experienced. And some of those emotions were just so similar that it, um, it rocked me pretty hard. You know, I was in denial for a while that I was just like, well, okay, so she will see that, you know, maybe she'll see that this is, this isn't what she wants. Not that I wanted that, but I was just processing through that denial. Like maybe she'll wake up and one day and say, you know what, I, I'm not really sure that this is what I want and we can take a step back. I do remember hoping at the very beginning, that there would be some some steps backwards instead of steps forward. And not as a detriment to you, but because I wanted to hold on to the person that I fell in love with so hard. And, you know, so I went through denial. I don't really remember going through anger with you. There, the Anger isn't really an emotion that plays into grief for me. Um, definitely the, there's five stages of, of grief. There's, you know, denial and then the anger, um, bargaining. I don't, I tried putting this, thinking about this and putting it into context here. You know, there, there were a few times that I felt maybe if I was different or if I was good enough or if I was, I, I don't know how to explain that part of it. Um. I don't know, I felt that maybe there was something lacking in me that made you feel like you wanted to transition. And then I realized how ridiculous that sounded, that it had nothing to do with me. Um, but those were some thoughts that I had as well. Um, the depression part of it, I, I don't know that I would call it depression in this context, but there was definitely sad um, sadness. Um, <clears throat> there were many days that I was very sad that I couldn't call you by, you know, your birth name or, you know, have those kinds of conversations that you have between, you know, a female and a male. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. And, um, and I mean, you kind of already started exploring what my next question was going to be. And, um, you know, my, cause my next question was going to be, you know, about the you know, balancing, you know, doing your best to be supportive of me, which you have never failed in doing and dealing with your own feelings of grief and loss and, um, you know, kind of coming around to get to know the, the new person that I am, which, you know, in some ways is new and in some ways is not. So, um, you know, was there, was there, ever a, like a you know when I would have some sort of new achievement 
or, you know, like, you know, getting my name legally changed or, you know, going on hormones for the first time. Um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that those things, you know, that you were happy for me with those things, but was there also sort of a kind of a driving the nail in the coffin kind of feeling with that along with it or? Um, I would say no, by that point, um, the next stage of grief is acceptance. So, and that's the last part of it. And that's what I was going to get to next was by that point, I had already, I, I believe that I had already moved through, uh, any of those feelings and I truly rejoiced with you at those milestones it was more it it was more things that I was processing on my own before I got to that point that hold on scratch that okay um I think it is I had already made it through I think those those stages by the time those very important milestones were happening. And by that time, it was just all good. It was all, you were very sure. And if you were sure, I was sure. And every milestone that you had, I was, I was right there with you. There wasn't by that, by that time, there was no negative uh, feelings of my own. Um, at that point, it was, our relationship had changed even, even more, trying to see you as, like, my best girlfriend instead of, you know, a person that I had a very deep, loving relationship with in, in a different way. Um, again, words fail me to try and describe our relationship, but, um, yeah, I think by, by that point, I had worked through anything that I needed to. And it was just, it was just good. I do remember you telling me, I think you might have been explaining transitioning to Jamie or Eric, I believe at the time, but you had said, really the person that you are on the inside isn't changing. It's just more or less what we see on the outside. And I agree with that to a point but there was so much confidence and so much more peace and happiness that came from the inside once you decided that this is what this is the path that you were going to take that you did change on the inside but it was all for the better <laughs> you preempted my next question again <laughs> oh, okay i'm pretty good at that <laughs> um because the the last question that i asked jamie and eric was also going to be the last question that i asked you and that's um you know how have you seen me change and and that and has going through this journey along with me you think changed you in any way oh my gosh <laughs> yeah. um I'll answer the last part of that first. Has it changed me? Uh, incredibly so. I, You are the first transgender woman that I've ever known. My eyes have been completely open to so many struggles of other human beings that I never knew existed. Growing up in such a small rural area, um, you know, things you just don't get to experience a, a lot of things. And just now when I talk to my own children, um, my relationship with you is always present in that, that I want them to grow up to be loving. I wanted them to grow up to be loving, accepting human beings, but I do shine a light on other issues um, such as persons who are transgender that I may not have before, not because I didn't want to support them, but it wasn't personal. And now it's personal. I hope that makes sense. So my own, the way that I love people and the way that I treat people has definitely been even more enhanced through my relationship with you. Um, what changes have I seen in you? I think that overwhelmingly it's been positive. I think you had said before that you were you were alive, of course, but that you weren't really living. And I think that watching you just over 
the last year, year and a half, um, I'll tell the listeners that I kind of have you keep a what a humble brag list <laughs> yeah. of, of your accomplishments that I think is so important to look back on. Um, do you want me to? Do you want me to explain that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I actually started having Callie keep a list of all of her ac- accomplishments, and it's probably about a year, a year's worth now. Um, but you're really living now. You're making a difference, and I think that that gives you such a sense of pride, and it just changes your whole life. And I see nothing but good. I, I think that your low points are a little lower now. I don't know if that's accurate or oh, not. Oh, yes. <laughs> that is absolutely accurate. I feel like your low points are a little lower. And, you know, your highs are definitely higher. I just think that things might be exaggerated for a while. Not in a bad way. Um, but overwhelmingly, you're just... You're very much the same, and you're so very different at the same time. And so um, I said that was the last question, and I lied. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The last question is, you know, being on the other side of this, obviously, you know, I talk a lot about how, you know, being transgender is not really an experience that you can fully understand unless you are. And conversely, I think you know, being on the other side of that equation, you know, being in love with someone, you know, being in a, a in a close relationship with someone who goes through that kind of a change is probably something that I don't have a re- frame of reference for, and I can't necessarily understand what that experience is like. So that being the case, I mean, is there anything here that you think is important to put out there that we haven't talked about, that we haven't covered so far, that I may just miss because I'm not on that side of the equation? Um, I don't think that there's anything that we haven't necessarily covered, um, but being honest on both sides of that equation, you being on the side that you're on, being open to hearing sometimes the ugly truth that it's not all good for the other person, that it hurts. And not that you've ever intended that, but it's, it is painful. It is painful to feel like you're losing someone that you are in love with. And on, on my side of it, just to always strive for unconditional love, no matter what the kind of relationship, no, no matter what kind of relationship you have with the other person, whether it goes from being romantic to just being friends uh, or indescribable as ours is, <laughs> just to always just to always love. And, you know, just to finish that thought there, I think that it's so important uh, to do everything that I can be to be a better ally, not just for you, but for all transgender individuals. That educating yourself is the most important thing that you can do. If you don't know what you're talking about, you cannot possibly educate other people. Um, you know, loving someone that is transgender is fantastic, but unfortunately it's not enough to change the world around us. So I had to learn a whole uh, plethora of things that I never knew before. That way, when I am confronted, and I have been confronted many times since this journey with you, uh, by coworkers or different things, things in the news, and people around me talk about transgender individuals, and they're just, I have to say, I was that way too, but they're just ignorant. They just don't know. And it's my job now to speak up and, and try and set some of those things straight. So the way that I am the best Ally that, ally that I can be is to educate myself and not be afraid to speak up on behalf of all of the lovely people that are transgender, including you. Oh, well, thank you, Marie, for a lot of things. Um, <laughs> for 
you know, you know, for always doing everything that you've ever done for me and for, um, you know, taking the time to be so open and honest on the show. That's something that I, that I take pride in is making sure that, you know, people feel safe being vulnerable on the show. Cause that's kind of what we're about. So, um, thank you so much for joining me on the show and thank you for your time. Absolutely. My pleasure. We'll be back with be a better ally on the Gatheist manifesto. Here's an excerpt from Mum, Dad, I'm an Atheist by David G. McAfee. It is the same highly regarded concept of an afterlife that allows misguided religious people to justify the mistreatment of those who disagree with their religious ideologies. They are simply trying to protect you from eternal damnation in the afterlife by condemning you, insulting you, and even disowning you in this life. It is not to say that becoming open about your disbelief is always going to be met with these negative reactions and, in fact, that is precisely what this work is hoping to prevent. But it is important to understand that if you experience negative reactions from religious kin, it is probably a result from the religion's teachings and likely not from any personal vendetta or hatred. Mom, Dad, I'm an Atheist by David G. McAfee is now available at AtheistAudiobooks.com. Here's an excerpt from Disproving Christianity by David G. McAfee. Each argument and contradiction presented will bring us closer to disproving the main pillars of Christianity using nothing more than logical thinking, statistics, scientific and historical data, and holy scriptures. The debates between Christians and non-Christians have raged for thousands of years, and I expect the conflict to continue. But I do hope that these arguments will allow those Christians who may not have questioned biblical fallibility in the past to realize that these texts are man-made and they represent the ideas of those fallible individuals who created and edited the compilation of texts now considered to be the Holy Bible. They contain errors, contradictions, and a stagnant moral code which, in many ways, no longer coincides with the morality of modern man. What I hope to gain from presenting these arguments and little-known biblical passages to the reader is a sense of understanding of Scripture which may not be presented in Bible study or in church, and for good reason. If read with an open mind, I truly believe that this book will open people's eyes to the wonders of free thought in a way that other works utilizing a more philosophical approach cannot. Disproving Christianity and Other Secular Writings by David G. McAfee is now available at AtheistAudiobooks.com For this week's Be A Better Ally segment, I'm going to flip things around a bit. Normally for Be A Better Ally, we talk about how other people can be better allies to a marginalized or oppressed group, especially those folks within the LGBTQ or atheist communities. But given the theme we have this week, this week I am talking to you, my fellow queer and trans folks. The thing we often forget is that these things, for most of us anyways, are things that we've struggled with for all are a very significant portion of our lives. We've had so much time to suss things out and to work our feelings out, to figure out what our wants and needs are, to think about how we plan to navigate the world once our secret is out and we no longer have to hide who we are. The folks who love us don't get the benefit of that time unless we choose to give it to them. So let's keep in mind that these journeys, though they are ultimately about us and our self-realization, they're not just about us. Our parents, friends, families, co-workers, and communities have to make a change too. It's unfortunate that in a society that is so oppressive toward norms surrounding gender and sexuality that such things are necessary, but unfortunately they are. The ones who are truly on our side will demonstrate it to us, but we need to be gracious to them too. 
For my friends and family, making the switch from seeing me wear gym shorts and band t-shirts all the time to wearing dresses and makeup and changing my name and pronouns, seeing me grow boobs, all of these things required an adjustment on their part. People are right to ask for time to adjust and to have conflicted feelings at first. Remember that as much as we ourselves are victims of a culture with such rigid standards surrounding gender and sexuality, our friends and families are too. This simply isn't a thing most people ever have to consider or deal with in life, so needing time to adjust and to get accustomed to these things is okay. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto on Secular Media Network. A couple of reminders before we close things out. I'm not speaking there, but I will be hanging out at the Pennsylvania State Atheist Humanist Convention on September 11th through 13th. Speaking there will be Seth Andrews, Matt Delahunty, friend of the show David Fitzgerald, Richard Carrier, and many, many more. For tickets, check out atheistpa.org. And I will be giving my first ever presentation at an atheist conference at the Carolinas Secular Convention the weekend of October 2nd through 4th. I'll be speaking alongside some people I have tons and tons of love and respect for, like Mandisa Thomas, Mr. Bobby C. from No Religion Required, Sarah Moorhead, and many, many more. For tickets, go to carolinassecularassociation.org. You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Manifesto. You can email us at thegatheistmanifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at Gatheist Cali, and you can find the show on Twitter at The Gatheist. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, and knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is The Gatheist Manifesto.